but I'm going to talk in English because um, I'm assuming that um, there are people around the world that would want to see this as well. Um, and for those of you with, who attended my talk about a month ago at uh, the Israel Bitcoin conference, um, the difference is going to be that I'll go um, at a slower pace and also I'll be able to go into more details about how zero cash works under the hood. So uh, there'll be some new stuff. And um, first of all, this is joint work with um, Alessandro Chiesa from MIT, uh, Christina Garman from John Hopkins University, Professor Matthew Green and uh, Jan Myers, also both of them from John, ha John Hopkins University, Professor Eran Tromer from Tel Aviv University, and Madal Zvirza from MIT. And as you can see, the color scheme here shows uh, the story that I want to tell you, which is um, the zero coin team meets uh, Skipper Lab, and what you get is uh, zero cash. <clears throat> so zero cash is an attempt to solve Bitcoin's anonymity problem that many just referred to. And what is Bitcoin's anonymity problem? So whenever someone pays you a coin, um, the transaction that goes on the ledger reveals a little bit of information about that coin and you can trace back uh, using such things as blockchain and uh, uh, block info and other things like that. You can trace back and see perhaps other coins that that person has. And similarly, uh, if you pay Starbucks with a Bitcoin, um, you can track a little bit uh, what they do with that coin. And this, of course, is undesirable and it's not the same as uh, in our other electronic transactions. Um, and I want to point out that you don't need uh, a lot of cryptanalysis for this and you don't need uh, you know, any fancy math, you just need a browser and a little bit of common sense to start gaining information about what happens before and after the transaction you just did with your coin. So um, now, and there's fancier stuff that you can do if you, you do a little bit of more of a graph analysis. You can learn even a little bit more about the structure of, of payments and funding and, and the way currency flows within Bitcoin. So uh, I want to tell you a little bit, first of all, about solutions because we offer a, another one. So the simplest one to explain is a Bitcoin mixer tumbler. And basically a lot of players give uh, their Bitcoins to a trusted central party, this would be the mix, and later on retrieve them. And now the point is that uh, outsider, outsiders, what they see is they just see a lot of payments to one place, and then they see payments coming out of that place, but it's going to be much harder for them to trace you know, which coin is yours. And the problems are that, first of all, every transaction, now if you want it to be sort of anonymous, you must send it through this mix. And the second problem, which is a big one, is that you have to trust this mix because you're actually paying the mix the coins and then you're, you're hoping you'll get it back. So either the mix could steal your coins or maybe someone else could attack the mix and, and steal your coins. Okay, uh, a better solution is, is coin join, suggested first by Greg Maxwell. And there what you do is you don't have to trust one central party, rather a lot of Bitcoiners, uh, sorry, Bitcoin owners can sort of pool together or join together in order to sign each other's transactions and jointly mix the coins. And um, the big advantage here is this already works uh, in Bitcoin using um, the, the, the script like um, um, language that already is with Bitcoin, so you don't need any modifications or forking. Um, but uh, the problems with this are that it's prone to denial of service attacks because basically you need enough for all of these people that are supposed to sign with you this mixed transaction, you need all of them to cooperate and if one of them or some of them, depending how you set it up, um, um, decide to attack it and not play ball with you, then this mix just won't work. And you also need to find these partners um, to do your coin join with. Okay, and the third problem, which also the, the, um, that is prone, uh, it's also a problem for the Bitcoin mix, is that the coin values themselves are revealed. And just by looking at coin values, you know, if I do a coin join or a mix where I use instead of one Bitcoin, like everyone else, I use 1.325. Then maybe just from that information, a coin at value 1.325 coming in and then going out, someone can learn a little bit about, you know, that being my coin. There's a question. 
Oh, I was just going to say, does this in general require more than uh, three parties to do this uh, this kind of uh, mixing that you're describing now? The coin join? Yes. Oh, well, I think it's a parameter. You can decide how many parties you want in order to coin join with. The more you add, the more anonymity you will get, but also the more trust you any, any one of them, or uh, depending how you set it up, you need to trust more players and find more players to mix with. So it becomes, uh, the DOS aspect becomes more prone, the more you increase that level generally, or? I think so, yes. <coughs> and, you know, all of these things are acceptable if you have a lot to hide, but the average user is uh, risk averse and wants something simple that is basically the protocol that you use and you don't need to go and find people and trust them and so on. And zero cash, we think, is a practical solution to the anonymity problem. And um, before we go any further, I want to address this question um, that already has been applied uh, or raised with respect to the predecessor of zero cash, which was zero coin. Um, should we even be doing zero cash? Because should we solve Bitcoin's anonymity problem? So there's a lot of discussion about Bitcoin, and some people say it's already far too anonymous and you know used for only for bad purposes. And so I want to address that before describing the solution. Um, and um, to answer that, we first have to answer, you know, do we think that something like Bitcoin itself is, is good, you know, a decentralized uh, payment system, is that good or bad? Because that also can be misused, and that's some of the claims leveled at Bitcoin. Um, I think that by analogy, I mean, we could ask a similar question about information systems, you know, what about decentralization of information? Is that good or bad? Something like the internet. We all know that the internet can be used for some very bad things because of it is decentralized and hard to track and see who puts, you know, who posts what. Um, so I think the answer to the second question, I hope we all agree the answer is yes, decentralized information systems are good. And hence, I would like to argue that also uh, decentralized um, payment systems are basically good, even though they can be misused like many other technologies. And um, once we answer that question positively, we should ask, is it good for such a payment information system to be leaking information every time you make a transaction? So if you buy coffee at Starbucks, is it reasonable that you allow Starbucks to look back into your history? Well, I think then the answer is no, that's not good. So if you agree on these things, then I think you should agree that something like zero cash and solving Bitcoin's anonymity problem is actually a good thing to have. Um, and now uh, people may ask, what about regulation? You know, what about tax? And uh, you know, is this uh, is this going to be used for avoiding tax or for avoiding or doing other bad stuff? So I want to answer this emphatically. Um, you know, it's up to society in different countries and different uh, places to decide what kind of regulation they want uh, to have for decentralized uh, anonymous um, or payment systems, just like they have to decide on the right amount of regulation for information systems like uh, the internet. And the jury is still out there, uh, but there are a lot of heated debates and, and you know, society will converge on the right uh, ways to regulate the stuff. And I want to say that the technology that goes into the construction of zero cash can be relatively easily adapted to support many other kinds of, 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 of schemes in which y you, you, know, you pay taxes and you prove that you pay taxes and you, you know, that even enforce these things. So um, no matter where you are you know, on, the, on, the, on this spectrum between libertarian and, and uh, regulation loving, um, wherever you are, uh, the technology that goes into zero cash can support the kind of regulation that you would like. Okay. Question so far? You just answered it actually. Uh, regarding you, can, you can make it if you so desire. You could say to some regulatory agency, "Yeah, here it is, and I can prove it." That, uh, yes, I'll get to that later. But yes, if you, if uh, you know, a country decides that every transaction, uh, five percent tax must be paid and proved. Yes, so you can implement that and build it into such a protocol. It would even be zero knowledge and no information other than the fact that you paid the taxes will be proved. So would this be zero knowledge specifically for you or what about anyone else who's be involved? In the zero knowledge protect, I mean, you as the one conducting the transaction know a lot about it, but no one else knows anything but for, again, if you're supposed to prove that you paid 5% tax on that thing, everyone will know that you paid 5% tax. They will not know how much you paid. Well, in other words, I, does this affect anyone else who's using the same scheme? The, the fact that I'm giving out knowledge, does this uh, 
reduce the anonymity of anyone else? Uh, as far as no, I would say not. Suppose uh, tomorrow a government decides that every zero cash transaction must incur a 5% uh, tax paid to a specific address, then now this would be a different kind of, we'll get to that, a zero knowledge proof. Everyone will be using it. So you will know that anyone making a zero cash transaction that actually verifies and checks out has paid 5% tax from whatever amount was involved in that transaction. But the fact that they do it is in no way, shape, or form uh, <coughs> compromises somebody else who wishes to still remain totally anonymous. Um, you, uh, no, no, anonymity is not compromised. What now in this system, <coughs> no anonymity is compromised, but you do know that everyone is paying 5% tax. So it doesn't compromise anyone's anonymity. It just, uh, you know, you're just enforcing regulation. Let's say you're enforcing paying 5% tax on every transaction. Okay, and, and, but you don't, no one even knows how much tax you pay, okay. right? They just know that it's 5%. Yes. Uh, can you enforce that uh, no one will uh, pay for child porn? Um, that's, uh, okay. It's going to be tricky to completely seal off such things because, and let me tell you why. If you give me an algorithm that decides what is um, child pornography, then I will say yes. Otherwise, you will probably need to have some human, um, suppose you want to uh, solve that. You would have to need, you would have, I mean, you would need some kind of whitelisting that involves eventually humans looking at information and deciding what is child pornography and what isn't. So anything that you can define a computerized automated algorithm for deciding on it, you can do it in zero knowledge and in an automated way under something that would be like zero cash. But again, deciding, I mean, there's this famous uh, saying about pornography, right? It's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. So I, I interpret that as meaning that there is, as of yet, no algorithm that actually decides you know, in an automated way, what is uh, pornography and child pornography? That could be a problem. Oh, but even if it's... It is a problem. I mean, it is a problem today already, period. It would be great if, you know, routers in the internet had an algorithm for deciding that. So, you know, if you have a solution for that already, that would be great without any connection to, you know, decentralized payment systems. Yeah. Same thing for terrorism and, you know, all illegal stuff. Of course, it just adds anonymity. I mean, it'll be harder for a centralized um, uh, entity like the government uh, to, 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 co to control, to oversee, to, to do what it does to try to minimize the use of, uh, of money flow into... Uh, As with cash. Right. right. True. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. Yes. Pallets of cash flow all over the world. <laughs> what? Pallets of cash flow all over the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's harder to carry a suitcase of cash. Of cash. You know what? I actually, I actually am not an expert on how to, uh, you know, make transactions for illegal stuff. So, you know, I know that people know how to do these things, and uh, you know, I actually don't want to go into that discussion. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So uh, the plan for this talk, and I'm very happy about all the questions, and please continue. So first of all, I want to talk uh, to describe a little bit uh, the predecessors in terms of uh, you know previous um, anonymous electronic uh, payment systems, um, and then I want to tell you about zero knowledge, which is this uh, concept, uh, um, theoretical concept, used to be now it's being reduced to practice that is called zero knowledge uh, proofs, and then I want to give you a bit more detail about how the zero cash uh, payment system actually works. <coughs> So um, pre-Bitcoin, we had already some, some wonderful suggestions for anonymous e-cash systems. And the first one was by uh, David Chaum called uh, e-cash. It was anonymous and it used this uh, wonderful new concept introduced by Chaum called blind signatures. And um, it required a bank, a central trusted party. Um, and the bank also re needed to use a secret key, some, some secret random key, and the bank used the secret key to mint coins. And then users could use it and the bank would keep tr uh, track of the accounts and every time the bank mints you a coin, you would deduct, uh, let's say, one 
dollar or whatever it is, one shekel from your, from your account. And the problems with this are, are two. One, you need a central secret, and also you need a central trusted party, which to Bitcoiners, I don't need to explain, is, is sort of a, something undesirable, or it goes against the grain of Bitcoin. Um, Sander and Tashma um, made a significant improvement by removing the need for, for a secret key, but they still required a central trusted party, a bank. And now the bank mints coins using zero knowledge arguments and Merkle trees, and we'll get to these concepts uh, later. And uh, this construction was anonymous. It was also secretless, which had the, which had the advantage that even if robbers uh, you know, storm the bank and, and, and try to find out these secret keys, they just don't exist. There are no secret keys. And uh, it, it was also theoretically efficient as an ecosystem. system. And by efficient, it assumed that you have uh, what's called efficient, non-interactive, zero-knowledge arguments of knowledge. And the point is that there weren't uh, efficient ones around, I mean, practically efficient ones to be implemented. This also had problems, which you, uh, one is that you needed a central trusted party. And another problem that also affected it is the point of divisibility and fungibility. So these were systems that were designed to work with single unit coins and preserved anonymity under that assumption. But if you want to divide and, and, and merge coins in an anonymous way, it was more problematic. <coughs> now, the big revolution with Bitcoin is that you don't need any more centralized uh, party, a bank. Uh, there's this wonderful protocol using proof of work to sort of um, sort out the history and also do the mining and distribution of, of, of money. <laughs> and after that, the first uh, anonymous uh, coin uh, that came after Bitcoin and, and relied on decentralized systems was, was ZeroCoin, uh, published one year ago by our um, co-authors on this work, um, Jan Miles, Gaumann, Green, and Rubin. And it used uh, efficient zero-knowledge proofs based on RSA accumulator, something I won't go into now. It extends Bitcoin with uh, a decentralized laundry, so there's sort of a mix, but one that doesn't rely on a central trusted party, but can be done in a decentralized way. The wonderful thing here is that there's no bank anymore, and there's only a trusted ledger, such as you know maintained by, by Bitcoin, the blockchain. And it was even implemented as a Bitcoin extension, and you can you know, download the code and play with it and, and use it. The problems with it were that it wasn't that efficient. You needed 25 kilobytes for every spend transaction, and um, these 25 kilobytes must appear on the blockchain. And it was also a non-fungible and non-divisible single denomination uh, um, kind of uh, mix, meaning you need to take uh, the same value for each coin and mix them together because otherwise you would reveal anonymity. Remember again, if I use 1.325 bitcoins, if they go into the system and then the same amount goes out, someone may link this information to me. Okay, so that's the fungibility and divisibility problem. Okay, uh, independent of our work, uh, um, a work by Danesis Fournet, Colvice, and Parno uh, called Pinocchio Coin. Um, address the question or the problem of uh, efficiency, this 25 kilobytes per spend transaction, and they reduced it significantly to 344 bytes, which is much better. And this is based on a wonderful system called Pinocchio, the Pinocchio Zero Knowledge System of uh, Parno et al., also published uh, a year ago. And uh, here, um, when I say all these measures about um, length of proofs, in, in also in, all work, in our work, refer to the length of the heaviest part, which is uh, the zero knowledge proof itself. So the zero knowledge in, in Pinocchio Con is 344 bytes, and there's a little bit more for all the extra information. The problems here are the scalability. So transaction, to generate a transaction, the time needed grows linearly with the number of coins ever used in the system. And again, it's non-fungible and non-divisible. You need single denomination coins. <coughs> and zero cash um, is the first divisible anonymous e-cash system. Decentralized, sorry, divisible, decentralized anonymous payment system. And it solves the problem of all these previous coins, such as ZeroCoin and Pinocchio Coin, and the previous ones, the centralized ones. So, first of all, it's pretty efficient. It's uh, the same order of magnitude as, as Pinocchio Coin, even a little bit better 288 bytes at a level of security of 128 bits. Uh, verification time is very fast, uh, roughly nine milliseconds on a, you know, a standard uh, fast computer. 
a transaction to generate a spend transaction. It takes uh, three minutes uh, on a single core, uh, you know, fast computer. If you use more cores, you can reduce it to roughly one minute. And that's not the end of the story. But it is costly to generate in time to generate a pay transaction. The, the point is that verifying a transaction is, is very quick. And it is fully fungible and divisible, by which I mean, for the first time, you hide not just the payer and the payee, but also the denomination and the value of the coins, OK? And yet you maintain um, integrity of, of payments. So it is the first fungible and divisible decentralized anonymous payment system. And it's also implemented in code that, that we will uh, open source when it's ready, hopefully soon. And there are a few uh, restrictions and disclaimers, so I'm going to show you this fine print. And, um, you know, any questions here? Good, so let's continue. Uh, yeah? Um, nine millisecond verification time and three minute uh, creation time? Yes. Is, that's uh, like the inverse of Bitcoin. Um, is that intentional? Or no, no, it's certainly not intentional. We would like zero, you know, milliseconds for both. Certainly not intentional. But I'm saying, what takes three minutes to create a transaction? We'll get to that. Uh, what takes a lot of time is generating a zero knowledge proof. Okay, that's what takes a lot of time. Verifying it, uh, fortunately, is very uh, efficient. I mean, it, you know, nine milliseconds. You could hope for more efficiency. Did but you say the zero, uh, zero knowledge proof increases the number of coins, or is that something else? No, no. Uh, in previous solutions, uh, the ah. proof, the, the, the scheme they used uh, in Pinocchio coin uh, had the scalability problem. We, we, we don't have it. Or rather, we have a logarithmic scalability which supports a much larger yeah. number of coins. Yes? Um, just for comparison's sake, uh, how much is about uh, the time to take to verify a Bitcoin transaction? I'm sure someone here can answer it better than me. I don't know. Does someone know? Probably about a second. Yeah, I don't know. Yes? Uh, are any of the coins <coughs> talked about uh, ever been used or traded? Again, I think others would be um, better suited. So the question is if, if any other of these coins has been used. I think I read on Wikipedia that some banks use the Chalms eCash. Um, you know, okay, I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I think zero coin is not currently being used, though the code is available. But even on that, I'm not. Does anyone know? I mean, is zero I coin. There's a leap zero coin that you can play with, but there hasn't been an actual alt currency release. Oh yeah, Lib Zero Coin definitely is out there, and you can use it. I urge you, you know, to use it and play with it. But yeah, I okay. So that confirms what I know. Actually, know there for zero. Yeah. No. Okay. So it's not actively used Zero Coin, and I don't think Pinocchio. Coin, I'm, not, I'm not even sure that the source code for zero for Pinocchio Coin is is out there. Okay, but yes. How do you hide? How do you hide the value of transaction? We'll get to that. How do we hide the the value? We'll we'll get to that in the technical part. Okay. Yes. Do you anticipate it will be used at point of sale, or it will be used to, you know, because of the, the time to generate transaction? Is it necessarily, in other words, that it's used right at the point of sale, or it could be used? In another Maybe a more general question: Is this practical in the real world, or this this, this version? Again, I would, be, I would be hesitant to answer that, but we'll wait and see in the sense that, uh, I mean, will this be used uh, in practice is, I think, a question about making predictions, and making predictions about the, especially about the future is pretty hard. I mean, we will let people play with it and try to use it, and whether it will be used or not, I, um, you know, I, I hope it will, but, yeah, other questions? Yes. Just to add on the bad question, uh, well, once you disconnect the history of coin with uh, the zero coin, you can have a wallet that, that just works like regular Bitcoin and use that for both point of sale and you won't have Yeah, that's why I asked because it seems like the, the three minute generation time really isn't relevant because, I mean, you could essentially uh, make the, the funds fungible before you go to use them. So if it takes three minutes to generate that type of wallet, it seems like that should be no problem. Again, I, I, whether you know whether three minutes or you know one minute, if you use multi-threads or even you know maybe shorter if uh, further op if optimizations are used, whether this will be useful and in what context, I you know I, I can't I don't I don't know 
you know, we'll wait and see, I guess, but. Maybe follow up just to make sure I understand. Is it possible or would, would it be possible to have like in one integrated system, two parts where one is you use zero cash style proofs and you know, this, all these expensive or relatively expensive transactions, but uh, can easily transfer to and from the normal Bitcoin ecosystem without any additional trust? That would be, okay, will Bitcoin, you know, uh, allow, I guess, uh, moving to zero cash and back? That's a question that Bitcoin has to decide. I mean, we will, uh, we will allow such things, but okay, so what is the question? Yeah. It's a different thing. You could okay. have an exchange that allows you to trade. Okay. Yeah, but okay. we're asking, is it possible to build a blockchain that is shared Bitcoin protocol and zero cash protocol? One blockchain with two parts, one of, it, one of them is, isn't anonymous? And the other part is anonymous, so we can... Yes, yes, we'll get to that. Yes, we, we actually, you know, we, we will use um, a version of Bitcoin on which you... Yeah, so you will have all the standard Bitcoin transactions and also you have zero cash ones living together. Does that answer that or...? So the Bitcoin transactions in this model are, are efficient? Well, they are as efficient as the bit. I mean, they are the standard Bitcoin transactions or whatever. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin. Whatever altcoin you want to right. put this on, you will have the altcoin transactions and they are as efficient as that altcoin allows. You know, the zero cash part does not affect that as all, at all. Okay. Okay. Sorry? Would it be a great mixing service? Basically, I mean, is this uh, what, what, a solution for mixing with you? Um, we don't think of it as, uh, you know, a mixing service. It is a, a protocol that by construction is anonymous and preserves the privacy of, you know, all payments done in it. Now, how it is used... Um, it would have, 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 have a mixing service on Bitcoin. Sorry? It could be used as a mixing service on Bitcoin, from what I understand. It, I don't know what it... I, I don't know what it can be used or cannot be used as. I can explain what the system does, but, uh, and you know, if You're people will sell socks with it, uh, I don't know. You're yeah. saying that by using this, you don't need to have a mixing service. You certainly do not need, again, it's, it's going to be like cash. So you do not need, when you're walking with cash and making payments, you do not need uh, uh, mixing services to make sure that the, you know, the coffee you just bought doesn't reveal information about, uh, you know, the candy that you're going to buy in, in two minutes. So it will be the same thing as, as there. And how it will be used, again, I, I, I don't know, you know, to make predictions about the future. So the, block, oh, sorry, you, the blockchain is only a, a few hundred bytes is what's required? Uh, a transaction, the, the new uh, crypto part is only a few, is uh, 300 bytes. Oh, okay. Okay, and there's a little bit more coming from, you know, other information. We'll see it in a minute. Okay, so I, I, I now enlarge the fine print because I actually want to uh, talk about this in detail. So, you know, should you trust this thing? Should you use it? Um, so first of all, uh, so I want to make these disclaimers. First of all, it uses some new crypto assumptions and, you know, some, oh, some fancy words like pairing-based cryptography, knowledge of exponent, um, and so on and so forth. And it requires more crypto analysis. The more, as, as with all cryptography, you know, we don't have any formal mathematical proofs that any of the crypto um, primitives that we use is actually sound. So you know this. Uh, what we do have is a lot of smart people looking at them and trying to hack them and attack them. And the more time passes and the more smart people look at them, the more comfort we have with believing they're, they're uh, secure. So the same thing is required here. Okay, and the more time passes, the more smart people look at it, the more we'll be able to trust it. Yes? So how old is this crypto? Um, it, well, pairing-based cryptography has been around um, a while, but uh, you know, each time you need something extra, you add a little bit more to it. So it would be a little bit hard to answer, especially, uh, I mean, yeah, um, this is sort of a general public talk. So uh, you know, which parts are new and which parts are um, are are sort of more well known? That would be reserved to a more technical discussion. Uh, Pairing-based cryptography. So when was Bonnet, Franklin, and Ju? I mean, I don't even. Um, you could look in Wikipedia about pairing-based cryptography and its uses, and that would give a better answer for how long that thing has been around. But the new extensions to that, so around 2000, there's some works on zero knowledge use of that and uh, knowledge of exponents even later than that. 
10 to 20 years, I would say. It's not as mainstream as RSA, let's say, or SHA-256, but it's definitely, you know, around. We didn't just invent it ourselves. Okay. Other questions? Okay, the second uh, thing that you need to know, and I'll say more about this, is that whenever you want to create a spend transaction, it not just takes uh, these uh, few minutes to create, but you also need this key that's roughly one gigabyte long. And um, another important thing is that this key has to be set up once and for all when the system is first deployed. And it has to be set up by a trusted party that uses a trapdoor and is supposed to destroy it. Okay, and if that party is malicious and does not destroy the trapdoor and keeps it, then it can forge transactions. Though it cannot break anonymity, but it can forge transactions. Okay, and let me dwell on this point. So zero cash, like these other systems that rely on a certain family of, of zero knowledge proofs, again, I won't go into too much technical details, requires what is known as a common reference string, CRS. And it has to be generated by a trusted party, again, once and for all, using trapdoors. And these trapdoors have to be deleted. Okay, a malicious generator can use the trapdoor to forge transactions, though not to break anonymity. Okay? And here's the warning. You know, when this thing is, is, is released and, and, and people use it, if someone um, creates this CRS and you don't trust them, don't use, um, you know, don't use this, this thing. Don't. Yes? Has there been any thought about uh, maybe creating a distributed uh, uh, you know, party to create this, this uh, secret? Like, you know, that if one of these five, or you, you take at least two out of these five people to betray the trust for the system to be compromised? Yeah, so let me answer that. Theoretically, this is uh, possible using secure multi-party computation. Doing this on a large scale, as large as you know, all the Bitcoiners or all the miners of the world, and doing this properly and correctly, is, and doing this also in practice, is a problem that, as far as I know, has not been solved yet. So, um, and in particular, uh, I mean, this is not part of, of our system. But theoretically, it can be done, and this is a great question for research and, and implementation. You know, implementing practical, large-scale, multi-party um, computations for things like this. Right. I'm thinking that even you know, from, from the pra practical level, even if you don't get all the money in the world, but just you know, 20 trusted parties uh, to create it in a way that you have to have at least 11 of them betray the system. That's already a great step in. in Right, so again, theoretically this can be done. It's, again, it's it, like zero knowledge, multi-party computation is known to be theoretically possible under a, ve a variety of assumptions and, and trust models and um, um, implementing it is not something that we are doing here and it's a highly non-trivial task to do it you know, the right way, okay? So I just want to compare uh, this trust to, to you know, the other solutions out there. And, and again, you know, if, if this thing is out there, you, you should ask yourself, do you want to use it? So let's first of all look at the other solutions and, and first of all the trust. Who do you need to trust and when do you need to trust them? So we, when you have a mix, I mean, these are the first two things, you know, who do you trust and when do you have to trust? And then we'll see, and then these last uh, four uh, lines uh, tell you what can a malicious uh, party do. You know, if it uses, uh, if it is malicious, okay, in each of these solutions. So first of all, a mix. A mix operator, you have to trust that single party, which is the mix operator, and you have to trust him or her for every transaction that you um, conduct, right? If it's compromised in the next transaction, you know, you're screwed. Um, and um, with CoinJoin, you have to trust, again, on each transaction, you have to trust the partners that you're joining coins with. With zero cash, you have to trust this party that generates this uh, common reference, reference string. You only have to trust that they were honest or that it or she was honest during setup, meaning that it really used a good source of randomness and deleted it. And that's it. Yes? No, no. Setup is... Uh, um, when the code, let's say, is first... Uh, it's, it's not the code. It's more... It's like this key that has to be generated. Now the key is, there's a secret trapdoor that goes into making the key, and that secret trapdoor is supposed to be deleted, okay? And what remains 
are just two public keys, one for approving and one for v verification. What you need, to, and this is done once and for all within the system and then can be used as many times as, as anyone wants. Okay, but you need, so your trust has to be that the trusted party that generated the CRS at the beginning of time um, really used the good source of randomness that no one saw and then destroyed the trap door um, and just left the um, two keys, okay? Yes, once globally for, for all, yes, okay? But in particular, if this thing is forked and, and you know used again or new system, so every time a version of zero cash is deployed and someone says, here's a new pair of proving and verification keys, you have to trust them for generating that honestly and then destroying the um, trap doors. Would it be apparent if, if, uh, uh, through some sort of the algorithm observation whether or not, in fact, it really was done you know, by observation of what's happening? In, in I think the trickiest part is, is knowing that they say that they destroyed the trap door, right? Because they, they, they say it, but you prove after the fact that, you know, like, uh, will, will there be like uh, uh, inflation going on? Because apparently you're saying they can free. Oh, 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 that's a good question. What happens if you have a malicious party? Will you, will you notice anything? Yes, eventually you will, because eventually you will notice that too many coins are out there. So yes, you, you could, you will be able to see it later on, but yeah, that would be, still be bad. Yes. Well, an idea I heard about this is just uh, recording someone, you know, the, for the bootstra bootstrapping of the system, you record someone with a video camera unwrapping a fresh Linux CD and installing everything and then dropping everything. It's not, you know, it's not mathematical proof, but it's the best with love. I, I think there can be no mathematical proof, especially of having, you know, not uh, keeping the, the trapdoor, okay? So it's, it's ultimately about trust. Will you, will you trust um, by whatever process, yes, uh, video or, or, you know, by virtue of, of the party that generates it or whatever it is. But um, this is an issue. And let me also stress another thing. This is not a feature. This is a bug. So it would be great not to have this. And I urge, you know, uh, there are a lot of smart people out there. If you have a solution that is as efficient and as good, please, you know, tell it to the world and, you know, that would be great. Okay? We do know of a solution and we are actually working towards implementing it at Skipper Lab. And that's the very bottom line. If you use things known as probabilistically checkable proofs and computationally sound proofs, then you really have very little trust. You have to trust something like that SHA-256 is a good collision resistant hash function, which I think most of humanity will believe. And that um, additionally, you have to trust something known as the Fiat Shamir heuristic, which many people um, which many people um, actually um, do trust. So I think the, the bottom line is, is, is the cleanest and nicest and simplest. The only problem is that putting it into practice efficiently, you know, with 128 bits of security and short proofs is something that has not been done yet, okay? But again, we at Skipper Lab are looking, uh, you know, into doing this and things like this. And, uh, but I want to tell you now about stuff that we actually did do and not stuff that could be done one day. Okay, and oh, and let me just go over, you know, what happens if you have a bad party? So what damage could be done? So with a mix operator, you know, uh, a bad mixer can steal your coins. It can't forge any coins, but it can steal, it can uh, reveal your, your identity, and it can also do a denial of service attack. With coin join, it cannot steal your coins and can't forge them, but it can compromise your anonymity and uh, perform a denial of service attack. With zero cash, so the thing that could be a malicious party could do is forge coins, okay? It cannot steal them, and it cannot compromise anonymity, and it cannot do a denial of service attack. And again, the bottom line is the cleanest, uh, theoretically, the only small problem is that it's not yet implemented in practice, okay? So, so far about, um, you know, the world of altcoins and so on. Now I want to tell you a little bit about, let's go deeper into zero knowledge and uh, then Skipper Lab, finally, is zero cash itself. So zero knowledge is a wonderful concept and I'm not going to tell you all there is to know about it. I just want to give you a flavor or example of what it does. So suppose um, I want to prove to you this statement. I own 30 bitcoins, okay? And the total value of them is 123.5 coins. Right now, the simplest way to do this is I would point you to, I would show you the unspent coins on the blockchain. 
um, that I control, and for each one of them there's a verification key, I would use my secret key that controls these coin to sign a statement like hello world, and you could decrypt it using the public key and see that I really know the key that controls these coins, okay? The problem is that by this process, the proof I am showing you reveals information to you. You now know which coins I have and you can track them, okay? So a zero knowledge proof achieves the same goals. You will still be convinced that I do own 123.5 bitcoins, but you will learn no more information about which coins they are beyond the fact that I you know, know coins, coin, 30 coins that amount to 123.5 bitcoins. And so formally a zero knowledge proof is some cryptographic proof that cannot be efficiently generated without knowing the keys of these, of these coins. It can be efficiently generated if you do know the keys and it can be easily verified and it reveals no more information about the coins, just the veracity of the statement. And zero knowledge proofs theoretically exist for any statement that can be efficiently computed even if it includes auxiliary hidden trapdoors and passwords and so on and so forth. Such things are known as NP statements. And how this can be done is, is, is magic and some very beautiful and deep math. Um, this was awarded the 2009 Gettle Award in computer science in the last year's Turing Award also went to Shafi Goldwasser and Silvia Mikali for inventing this uh, wonderful concept. Okay. And to get zero knowledge to be efficient, uh, this is something that has been you know, sort of an open problem, getting it for general systems for, for something like 30 years or so. And um, ZeroCache uses some cutting edge techniques from Skipper Lab that attempts to um, reduce to practice some of this wonderful theory about zero knowledge proofs. <coughs> So the engine, the particular engine that we use, uses uh, in inside zero cache, coming from Skipper Lab, is we call, I mean, it is known, uh, it has several names, but it's known uh, as a zero knowledge, pre-processing, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge, or SNARK. This is the word that we like to use. And it also goes under different names, like a succinct, non-interactive, zero knowledge proof, or a succinct NISIC, and a succinct CS proof, and a ZKA, zero knowledge argument, a lot of other names. And the construction relies on a lot of beautiful techniques and, and, and um, contributions over the past few years on elliptic curve cryptography, quadratic arithmetic programs, and quadratic span programs, on linear PCPs, uh, efficient fast Fourier transforms over finite fields and elliptic curves. Um, quasi-linear PCPs, um, routing techniques, and so on, and there's a long, very long list of, of academic contributors to this line of research. The implementations that are closest to the one used in zero cache is, first of all, Pinocchio, um, which is an implementation reported uh, last year by Parno Gentry, Howell, and Reykova. It is based on the quadratic uh, span program of Genau et al. And uh, the second implementation is the SNARKs for C, which was a paper that we published last year at Crypto, uh, one of the cryptography conferences, and that's by, Zero, uh, by Skipper Lab. So what is Skipper Lab? It's an academic collaboration of researchers from MIT, Technion, and Tel Aviv University seeking to bring to practice cryptographic proof systems that provide succinct computational integrity and privacy, the R is for the research. So you get Skipper Lab. It started in the summer of 2009 with uh, Professor Ran Tomer, my uh, co-PI, and uh, Alessandro Chiesa and Daniel Genkin. Madars Virza, who is a co-author on this publication, um, joined us in 2002. The initial funding, you know, we're grateful to the European Research Council. Um, that was a major source of support for the programming team and still is. And let me also use this uh, opportunity to say that we're, as always, seeking you know, superb crypto math programmers to join the team. Now, the title was that Zero Cash is Skipper Lab meets Zero Coins. We both, both parties presented in last year's uh, Bitcoin conference in San Jose and there are videos of both talks there. And then we started talking shortly after. The issue was that Skipper Lab builds you know, general purpose um, zero knowledge systems that work for um, any computer program out there. These systems are very heavy and not as efficient, um, but they are full generality and you know, work for any program. Zero coin needed specific optimized program and we sort of fine tuned and reduced our construction to arrive at zero cache. Now, for the rest of the time, how much time do I have? Eight minutes. 
Okay, 15 minutes. So the re remaining 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how zero cash works. So first of all, zero cash doesn't stand alone. It always goes on top of a base currency and think of Bitcoin or you know, any of the other, other alternative currencies that have some mechanism for agreeing on the history, proof of work based or something like that. Um, we rely on that. So, and um, we're gonna always support, I mean, zero cash supports the transactions of the base currency. And this goes back to one of the questions. So if it's Bitcoin or Litecoin or any of these other coins, any uh, transaction that appears there will also be supported um, under zero cash. It's an addition that goes on top of that. We also support converting coins from the base currency into zero cash and returning them and turning them back into uh, base currency coins. And zero cash transactions are fully anonymous. They are fungible and divisible. They allow you to split and merge coins in a way that reveals nothing about the um, uh, value of the coins or the payers or payees. And you can even reveal a little bit of public information if you want some of the value of the coin to be publicly paid, say for transaction fees and so on. So there are two main transactions. Uh, one is a mint, and it's the simpler one because it doesn't in require any fancy you know, moon math. Um, no zero knowledge snarks. Uh, it just allows you to convert, let's say, one Bitcoin into one zero cash coin. And I'm not gonna say much about that. So you're gonna take a uh, coin with value V, and you're going to mint from it a new zero cash coin with the same value, okay? The main transaction that I'm going to explain, and this is where the you know, moon math goes into, is the poor transaction. And the way we construct it, it allows you to take up to, uh, to take the sum value that appears in up to two previously uh, existing uh, zero cash coins, and take their value and pour them, pour that content into up to two new zero cash coins and even one public payment that could go back to the uh, you know, original base coin or be used to pay um, taxes or public uh, transaction fees or whatever you want. Okay, and let me just read this disclaimer here. I'm gonna explain a very simplified zero cash protocol. The full details, which are far more intricate, will appear in, in the paper. Okay, so this is just simplified uh, you know, taste of how it works. Now, before I explain how it actually works, let me give you a little bit of crypto preliminaries. So let me remind you what a collision resistant hash function is. It's a function that shrinks uh, you know, strings. Let's say for concreteness, it takes 512 bits and maps them into 256 bits. And it's a function that's very easy to compute, but it's very hard given this 256 bit long string, it's very hard to find a pre-image, or if you even know a pre-image of that thing, it's very hard or even infeasible to find another one, okay? And as far as I know for SHA-256, which is the one that we use, I think that to this day, uh, no one has found yet a collision, two strings that map to one, um, to one string. And let me just say that mathematically, there are many, many strings, many, many pairs of strings that actually map into the same thing. This is just because there are far more, it's the pigeonhole principle, there are far more uh, strings of length 256 bits than there, sorry, of length 512 bits than there are of length 256. And in spite of that, no one has found two concrete strings that map to the same one. Okay, so this is a collision resistant hash function and it's very useful to commit to information and hide it. So Alice can use this uh, collision resistant hash function to hide information. So suppose she has some string that's 256 bits long and soon we'll see how she uses it and she wants to hide it. So she's gonna pick another piece of randomness, R, and what she's gonna do is she's gonna concatenate S and R, and now she has a string that's 500, 512 bits long, and she's gonna apply the hash function to it and publish it to all the world to see. The point is that someone seeing this cannot easily reconstruct what S and R were and cannot learn what is committed there. But Alice can later on prove that she knows S by revealing R and then allowing the whole world to apply the hash function to it, okay? So that's how hash functions can be used. And another thing is you can apply this repeatedly and take, uh, let's say, a string that's 1,024 bits long and apply hash twice mapping it to 512 bits and then to 256, and now you've committed uh, to a much larger string uh, by a very short string, and the same process can be applied. 
Okay, and this brings us to the next thing that is also a very useful cryptographic primitive and one that we also use in zero cache, and that's a Merkle tree. So assume now that you have D uh, strings, bits, or C commitments to information. Each one of them is already 256 bit long, and it's commitment to some file, right? Each one of these CIs is a commitment to some information that's hidden by it. Now, what you could do is compress all of this information into one short um, commitment that will be 256 bit long. And the way you do it is just recursively uh, apply to pairs uh, the hash function and shrink um, these things into, yeah, does this make sense? You take D things, you map them into D over two things, you take the D over two things, map them to D over four, and after log D many iterations, you have reached one single string that's 256 bits long, and it commits to two to the D many uh, files, and we're gonna use this. In particular, we are going to support, I mean, zero cache will support, each one of these Cs is going to soon be a commitment to information about a zero cache coin. And we will support, zero cache supports, um, using or remembering or a system that has up to two to the 64 coins, which is a pretty large number, okay. Questions so far? Okay, these are the preliminaries, and so far this is, you know, this is cryptography from the 1980s. Now, this is what a poor transaction looks like when it is viewed by, let's say, by a miner, by a verifier. So this is viewed by the rest of the world, not by the party that generates the poor transaction. So what is a coin, or rather, what is a coin commitment? A coin commitment is um, a commitment to the value of the coin, to an address, that's the third thing here, an address that controls the coin, and to a serial, uh, sorry, to a piece of randomness that will be used in the future to generate a serial number, okay? Now, what are these piece, three pieces? So the value is just, you know, how much value lies in this coin. The address, the public address, is something that will allow us to decide or, or to know who controls um, this coin. And the serial number will be used to destroy the coin and prevent double spending. And we'll see how it works. So the coin is controlled, as in Bitcoin and other altcoins, the control of a coin goes by a secret key. And the secret key is this address, you know, the secret key of the address. The, the point is that the public key that goes with the secret, sorry, that goes with the secret key that controls the coin, the public key is the hash of the secret key, which means that Alice could, I uh, suppose Alice controls this coin, right? So somewhere you saw this commitment. Alice knows the secret key, that con the secret address key that con controls the coin. She could, if she, sh uh, so chooses, she could prove that she knows this coin or she controls the coin by revealing her secret address key, right? And the secret serial randomness, which she also knows, okay? By hashing it, you're saying? Yes, if she reveals, so if she just reveals to the whole world the value, the serial number, the serial randomness, and the address, and the secret key of the address, then everyone could apply the hash function, you know, concatenate zero to it, um, apply the hash function, see that, and apply the hash again to the serial number, the value, and really know, or, or be, you know, it will be evident that Alice actually controls this coin. But she won't do this, she will prove statements in zero knowledge about her knowledge of these secret keys, and that's the new part. Okay, the serial number, that will be used to destroy a coin once it is revealed is itself the hash of the address secret key and the serial number, okay? And what I want to emphasize is that you can, I mean, if Alice owns the, owns the coin, she can generate the serial number and prove that she knows it because she knows the our serial, she knows the randomness that generates the serial number, and she knows the secret key that goes with the public key. No one else can do this, right? If you just see um, the commitment, you cannot deduce from it our serial, and you cannot deduce from it 
the public address, and you cannot deduce from the public address, you can't deduce the secret address, which are necessary in order to generate the serial number. But Alice, if she, know, if she owns the coin, she knows the, the, her secret address and the serial number, and she controls the coin and can prove these things. <coughs> okay, so what a full node, a verifier or a miner, uh, to take the Bitcoin jargon, should, should keep and, and maintain, is a Merkle tree of all previous coin commitments, okay? Every time some transaction mentions a coin, uh, the miners should add it at, as a leaf to this big Merkle tree uh, that will be the commitment of all coins that ever existed, that were ever mentioned in any transaction. Yes? But does the Merkle tree uh, mix all previous uh, transactions of the same uh, Bitcoin address or zero cash address? All, all, the all, all, commit, all Bitcoin, sorry, all zero cash coin commitments that ever appeared will be sort of compressed into this thing. Um, but I want to point out that a miner does not need um, to maintain the whole Merkle tree. My question yes. In the entire network? Of yes. The famous network. Yes. Yes. And as I, I want to point out, the, the, this miner does not need to maintain. Um, all of the leaves of this, all the leaves of this tree, just the uh, root and update it. And there are ways to update the root efficiently with uh, basically log depth, many steps per. Doesn't have to download this entire uh, tree. You're saying? Sorry. This miner doesn't have to download the entire tree to uh, start working. Like well, I would say that a miner, when it sort of fires up for the first time, it either trusts some someone else, or it, you know, as in Bitcoin, if you start from the genesis block, you probably want to generate this route by by yourself, going through all transactions in the world. But whenever the, the amount of space you need or memory in order to do this process is only logarithmic in the depth of the tree, which is. So even if you support two to the 64 leaves, it would take you time two to the 64 to generate that root, but the amount of space you need would be proportional to 64 times uh, 512 bits or whatever it is. Yes, yes. Another question, I know Merkle trees use from distributed systems and especially in all single databases for the replication, if you want to you know which files to move to, to the replica, but I understand it can scale to single cluster, no single database cluster. But will it scale to entire payment network? So I think yes. I think yeah. I, I don't see a problem with 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 this thing. Yes. The question about scalability of this Merkle tree, and I want to say that I think that. Uh, Sorry? Bitcoin uses them, I think, so it should be right. Yeah, I mean, Merkle trees are used all over the place and they're very efficient, and this is not going to be a bottleneck, that's for sure. Okay. Um, the other thing, which is a little bit more consuming and, 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 and maybe a little bit more worrisome, is that um, every one of these full nodes needs to maintain the full list of spent serial numbers, revealed serial numbers. And here you, you can't really compress them. You really need to maintain the whole list of all previously spent serial numbers because every time a new transaction is, is being um, shown, one has to verify that the serial number has never appeared before. Okay, so this is more um, space consuming. There should be a shortcut with bloom filters, which would do most of the time the shortcut. Like save you lots of performance. Okay. Possibly we can take this offline and discuss it. So the crucial thing is that an observer cannot link a serial number to any particular coin, right? Because the coin is just a commitment of some randomness that is used using some other secret information in order to generate the secret, uh, the serial number. So if you see both uh, the list L and the Merkle tree and all the information there, you cannot link any serial number to any particular coin. So what is a poor transaction? What does it look like? So remember, we allow taking up to two coins, the value from up to two coins, and pouring them into two new coins. So a poor transaction contains two serial numbers, two new serial numbers, hopefully, um, the ones of the coins that are being destroyed. So they're now revealed for the first time. There's um, reference to the root of the current Merkle tree that contains all coin commitments ever made. and 
as you recall, we said that we also support a public payment. So whatever value you want to put into the public payment, let's say for a transaction fee, can go there. And then there are two, up to two new coin commitments, C double prime and C triple prime. And then the big part, or the main new part, I mean, it's not that big, it's 288 bytes long, but the important part is, is this proof, pi. And the proof is a zero knowledge proof of a statement that I will describe later that basically says these coins are, are, are okay, they're legal, they appear somewhere on the ledger, and sorry, on the, in this Merkle tree, and all the keys and, and hashes were verified to be okay, and their value has been redistributed between the two new coins in, in an honest way. Now, what does a full node need to do when he sees a new transaction of this form? It needs to verify the zero knowledge proof, which takes nine milliseconds. And then it needs to check that the serial numbers have never appeared in the, this list of previously appearing serial numbers. And if both things work, then this is a legal transaction and he can add it to the block and also take uh, uh, the transaction fee uh, that appears in the VPUB, in the public value, and also needs to add these two new coin commitments to the Merkle tree of, and, and update the root so that they can be used in the future. Questions so far? Uh, how much time does it take to verify that uh, S and, and S and uh, tab weren't uh, I would say that that depends. Um, so I can't answer that off the top of my head, but I would say this is, a, this is not related to cryptography. This is a standard you know, database, uh, efficient data structure problem have a list, it depends on the length of the list and how you, you know, you're going to use hashes or other things and... Uh, um. Bitcoin doesn't already with transactions with proof of this. It's very quick. It's a question of uh, yeah, checking if you know, a number appears in a list of numbers. So... Uh, it's even better, you have to do Okay. How much time do I have left? Uh, you don't. <laughs> yeah, let me let me just show you what the zero what the zero knowledge statement is, okay? So the zero knowledge statement is something like this, and this is what goes into the proofing. Um, when a party makes a zero knowledge uh, one of these uh, payments, one of these poor transactions, the zero knowledge proof is a proof of the following statement. <laughs> I know the locations of two coins somewhere in a tree that has, in a Merkle tree that has as its root the current one root. And I know the values hidden inside the hashes of these coins. And I computed correctly the serial numbers, meaning I know the secret address keys which go with the public address keys which are hashed with the value inside those coin commitments. And I also know the hidden, the hidden values of the two new coins, and I summed up the values of the old coins and compared them to the values of the new coins and the public transaction fee, and those two things equal. And maybe some extra stuff if you want to prove. The point is that, and this goes back to the point I said, zero knowledge, you can prove anything that can be efficiently computable Computed, you can also prove it in zero knowledge by changing a little bit the statement that you're going to prove. So in particular, if you want to do um, some kind of regulation or prove that you pay taxes, you could modify this uh, statement that you're proving and say that you paid you know, 5% or here it's 18% VAT tax on this transaction and you donated, you, know, you contributed to the Bitcoin Foundation and so on and so forth. So uh, let me end up by saying that uh, Zero Cash is the first uh, fully fungible, divisible, decentralized, anonymous payment system, which is based on a decentralized ledger like Bitcoin, and it also comes with an implementation. It solves, or it's one more solution to Bitcoin's anonymity problem. We think it's a little bit better than previous solutions. It uses cutting edge uh, constructions of zero knowledge proofs. And you're probably asking, when will it be ready? So the paper is going to be published May 18 at the Oakland Security Conference and hopefully uh, we'll have a version of, of the paper itself online um, before that. The code will be open sourced when it's ready. We hope it will be ready as soon as possible. And we haven't really discussed you know, deployment so there, there's no information I can tell you 
about uh, you know how or when it will be actually deployed. And again, if you know of uh, you know smart uh, crypto math programmers that want to work with us on such things, then please send them over. Thank you very much.